you know, maybe the worst thing for a filmmaker is to get censored unless the whole subject of your movie is about censoring. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore, and I am pleased to talk to you today about a fairly unusual horror, suspense, thriller. It's genre-defying. It's about the realm of horror film and how we see it. It's through the eyes of a woman who plays a film censor in England, and we have Prano Bailey Bond, the director of Censor here, with us today on the Film Threat Podcast to talk about her movie. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Ah, oh, it's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I love that this film is a period piece because it's set, is it set in the late 70s, early 80s around-ish? Yeah, mid, early to mid 80s, yeah. Yeah, it. I love that because, I don't know, I guess today, you know, uh, modern devices like cell phones are so much a part of the plot that I'm glad that that is just sort of taken away. And this era, there was that era in the 80s of 80s horror that really, it seemed like every movie was taking it one step too far. So setting a film around in that era around uh, uh, people who work in on, on the film censor board was fascinating. How much went into research to ground this movie in a reality of that era? And were there nods to horror films at that time? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, this era is fascinating from a, a UK perspective because basically the birth of VHS led to this like boom in low budget horror becoming available, which could now go direct to the home. And in the UK, um, the thinking was that these films were going to sort of spawn the next generation of murderers and psychopaths, that people could now rewind and rewatch these horrible scenes over and over again. And it was going to do something to our brains that was going to make us go out and garrote each other with shoelaces or whatever weapon we could find lying around the house. So it's a really rich period to sort of explore our relationship um, with horror film. Um, and loads of research went into, into the project. I mean, one of the first places that me and my co-writer went was the BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification, which, you know, there's a censorship office in the film, but it's a fictional censorship office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, yeah, we went there and we talked to the, the people that worked there and we looked through some of their files and read about the way that the censors were talking about these films during this period. I spoke to film censors who worked there during the time. I also read tons of news articles that were about, um, I guess, the moral panic around these films during this period. So, you know, we're talking about articles, tabloid press articles with titles like things like taken over by something evil from the TV set. And, you know, they'd have like these pictures of, you know, demon goats coming out of the TV and like grabbing small children and, um, I mean, I was really steeping myself in the research and in the period to, I guess, be inspired by it and, um, and, and make the film as authentic as possible, even within the kind of heightened uh, sort of style of, of, I guess, my filmmaking. It definitely seems authentic to the era. And you, you brought up an interesting point about censorship. I feel like there's always been some effort on the part of our media to, and and sometimes government um, and, and politicians to blame a thing for why something happens. When I think if someone's gonna get triggered, they're just going to be triggered, whether it be, I mean, comic books, they tried to ban, they did commissions on, on comic books uh, in, in the 50s. Uh, you know, movies have been a target and especially that early era of 80s horror. And of course, more recently, it's been all about violent video games being the cause. Uh, the movie, definitely you tap into this. I really love the use of tactile technology. And by that, I mean, you know, typewriters and physically taking notes. I mean, it took me aback watching it. I'm like, oh yeah, we used to use those things back in the day, you know, 
fax machines and whatnot. I I really love that that you almost in a sense kind of fetishized over those details. Um, uh, I you may, maybe you didn't see it as that, but I I really thought that 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 attention to detail was amazing. But then there's a whole other story with your lead character and you know a trauma and a a, a family tragedy that occurs. I I don't want to give away too much, but that really that sort of takes the film down a, a whole different road and a, and a mystery that unravels um, through to the end. Um, what, it, what inspired some of those aspects and, and, and whatnot? Just, just there's, a, there's so many layers to the film. It really is like a salted caramel with lots of other candy bits in it. It's, that's at least how I saw it. I love that. That's uh, no one's described it like that before, <laughs> um, but that's that's fine. I welcome that description. Um, I guess with um, with Enid's sort of backstory, I was always really interested in exploring both the idea of um, censorship in art and film, but also the way that we um, self censor, um, and that can sometimes be out of our control. So, you know sometimes our brains will censor something that's traumatic because perhaps we're not equipped in that moment to be able to deal with that trauma. And I wanted to, I guess, explore maybe the parallels and the dangers of both censorship in art and the idea of somebody not being able to access a memory um, and that that has maybe that event that they can't quite piece together has perhaps shaped who they are as a person. So, you know, Enid, Enid strives to protect through her censorship. I think David Cronenberg once said that the, the censor who is driven to protect is the most dangerous censor of all. And um, that was a really great quote to have in the back of my head when I was thinking about the character that uh, through her backstory, um, you know, she she feels that she wants to protect, that she wants to make up for something. And that's perhaps why she became a censor in the first place. And it's what drives her decisions as a character. Um, so there were kind of a lot of links in terms of censorship and then also in terms of the idea of um, ambiguous loss. So if we don't know what happened to somebody, if someone goes missing, then we fill the gap of knowledge with, I guess, fiction in a way. Um, we maybe uh, one day have to come to terms with maybe they're dead, so we grieve them. And then the next day you think, well, I have no proof that they're dead. So how could I possibly give up on this search? They must be still alive. And, you know, you're constantly creating a fiction to um, fill that gap uh, of, of, of knowledge. And so I guess that was another way of exploring um, the relationship between fiction and truth in the film. I'm so glad you brought up Cronenberg because this really had um, at least echoes and whispers of, of early Cronenberg, I, which I love. Um, and it, for, for me personally, there was a shocking moment. There's a close up of a death certificate in the film and the date on the death certificate is my birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> my actual birthday. I was so, uh, it, it just, I had to stop the movie and take a screen. I took a screenshot. I'll post this on my Instagram or something. But it it just, it took me aback of like, oh my God, like this is, uh, uh, yes, an extra level of, of shock for me. <laughs> um, your lead character, Enid, goes down a path where um, I don't want to give too much away, but I began to question as she questions her reality, I feel like I'm questioning the reality of the film and it really messed with my head. Can I ask like your like intention in some of those, in some of those scenes? Cause I thought, well, is that, did she do that? Like, I, I really, I really had to question myself. I think, I think, I think it just needs a, a repeat viewing to be able to, because I, I, I believe that some of, some of the occurrences are, are in her, she's, she's just imagining some of it. Um, 
Maybe you don't want to give a conclusive answer, but I'm really just curious what your thoughts are because I love movies that I feel like the director is 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 toying with me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything has to have an answer as the director. You always have to know what's really going on. But um, I won't give any conclusive answers because I think that destroys the experience for somebody coming into the film and watching it for themselves. But I, I really am fascinated by the lines, uh, the blurred line between fiction and reality. Um, so that was absolutely something that I wanted to kind of uh, play with and toy with through the film and how our reality is constructed. Um, so Enid is kind of constructing her reality, her perception of reality is being constructed through the film, even from things like, you know, the gap in her memory perhaps being filled with something that she sees in a film and how does that then affect her reality and and propel her to um, take action in reality and what are the consequences of that so it's kind of like a overlapping continuous conversation between fiction and reality um, so Yes, I'm glad it kind of twisted and blurred the lines for you. And I hope that uh, people do watch it a second time, actually, because um, there's a lot of layers in there. So hopefully people will see more. Um, but I'd leave it always to the audience to have their own experience with the film. Well, well I do appreciate that you did that. Like, I, I just feel like memory is a an unreliable, can be an unreliable narrator, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, um, so, so I, I'm glad that you toyed with with that idea. Uh, in in your research, I'm curious, like how I love how specific the Enid's like censoring of things is. Like when you see her taking the notes and some of the we have to do this and and whatnot. Um, and I feel like you created this entire fictional universe of filmmakers and movies from the '80s that had to be fun to have to recreate that and then to not only create like the things like that we may not have seen that were off screen that um, Enid was seeing and some of the other characters were seeing and then you had to kind of fill in those details of like they're writing down specifics. How much fun was it to put together that, uh, that universe and fill out that world? Oh my God, so much fun. It's like a playground for somebody like me who kind of loves these movies. Um, it was really fun, actually, because I guess there was a moment where I, you know, there's two reasons why I wanted to create those and not use existing films. Um, you know, one is obviously narratively, it has to kind of fit with Enid's journey. So you have to have films within the film that um, are operating on a narrative level that's going to kind of connect with what's going on in her head. And, and so they have to be bespoke. Um, but also... I wanted, um, I guess, like, I think horror fans, uh, you know, avid horror fans have an encyclopedic knowledge of horror films. So um, for me to, like, put a real horror film in the film is going to pull people out of the experience of, of the character in this particular story. So um, that was, like, a great excuse to be able to, like, invent my own video nasties. Um, and I had so much fun, I guess, then being able to like reference um, films from the period. So, for example, um, there's one film that Enid watches. Um, and for that, I was really looking at like, you know, gothic, gothic folk horror. So things like Blood on Satan's Claw, but also a film like Lisa Lisa, which is also titled Axe, which is like both of them are kind of like 70s horrors. Um, and then for other, another video nasty within the film, I was really inspired by like Lucio Fulci's work. Um, and so I got to like play with some of these ideas. And I guess there were moments on set where I was like, I have to be Frederick North now because I'm not directing my film. I'm directing the film within the film that's directed by Frederick North. So even on set, you become a little bit meta because you're thinking, you know, so what would Frederick North do now? Um, I, uh, yeah, I didn't go too far with that though, because he's obviously uh, a bit of a sinister character, so. 
Well, the, I, I I love that aspect. I want to see the connected sensor universe. <laughs> um, well, I you know censorship just as a conversation is so top of mind. I think you know especially online. And you mentioned earlier, you know, self censorship. I I feel the film, you know, it, it's not that's not totally on the surface, but I really love that the film deals with those issues. They're, re they're really, you know, there really are these layers, like I said, like a candy bar where you discover a walnut that maybe you did not expect. But um, is, is that part of what also inspired it? I mean, the, you know, in addition to the fun world building and whatnot, like, there is a lot going on today with regard to censorship. And I think the film lightly touches on it. Um, which I'm, I'm pleased, but I'm curious as to your thoughts. Well, I mean, when we were developing the film, there were a couple of times where, you know, people would say, oh, well, why don't you set this, you know, why don't you make this a contemporary uh, film? Why does it have to be set in the past? Because films are still being censored now and there's still uh, so much conversation around censorship now. But my reason for setting it in the past was one that this is a really rich period to talk about censorship but also I think there's um, by looking back um, in hindsight you can be slightly more objective um, you can kind of pick it apart a little bit more so I mean when we're talking about the video nasty era specifically in the UK there was a lot of uh, politics going on around this this was Thatcher's Britain um, you know so while you have video nasties being blamed for all the terrible things in the world, actually what was going on in the government was not uh, creating a great society for people. So perhaps some of the bad things that were going on in the world were actually um, being caused by those things. But how convenient we can blame all this on uh, video nasties. But I do think like when you talk about, I don't know, social media and, and, and I guess the contemporary world, I, I think it's more about how our reality is constructed. I guess that's one of the things that I, I think about a lot in terms of, you know, how is our perception of what's going on in the world constructed by, for example, what we're being told in the news, you know, and the things that uh, are being shared in the news and the things that aren't. So, you know, I think that's something I've thought about a lot over the last year in lockdown that in fact, all my information of what's going on outside in the outside world is coming through my screen and coming through the news and coming through social media. And is that actually reality or is that like a, a construction, you know, and how does that affect me in my life and the way that I'm sort of seeing the world and seeing what's going on in the world? So I, I've definitely been thinking about that a lot over the last year and it's certainly something that's like there in censor and there in terms of, you know, for example, the way that the tabloid press are, um, are creating a hysteria around these these video nasties. It, it's, it's almost as if the media has its own script, you know, and its own, uh, it, its own story to tell. So, um, Prano Bailey Bond, thank you so much for joining us on the Film Threat Podcast. Uh, the movie Censor is out now um, as, you're, as you're watching this and available. And it's really a remarkable uh, horror thriller suspense period piece, love letter to 80s horror. Um, and it you, you need to see it. So thank you for joining us on the Film Threat Podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure.